couple years back I got a phone call from a friend. I attended a Dharma talk where the teacher had said that the second noble truth was that life is suffering. So the friend called up to scoff at the teacher had said that. So of course everyone knows that's not the second noble truth, it's the first noble truth. And so I had to tell him that it wasn't any noble truth. The Buddha never said that life is suffering. He said there is suffering in life. That was his first noble truth, and he identified what it is. But then he went on to say that there is a cause for suffering that you can abandon, and there's a path to the end of suffering that you can develop. So you can reach the end of suffering, all of which can be found in life. So life isn't just suffering. And it's important to underline that fact, because so many people misunderstand the Buddha's attitude towards happiness and suffering. Just this last weekend I heard someone say that the Buddha's teachings are all things are in constant, all things are suffering. Well, that's not the case. As he once said, if there were no pleasure in the five aggregates, we wouldn't be attached to them. They do offer pleasure. And it's important that we understand the different kinds of pleasure they offer. So we can use that pleasure as a means to the highest happiness or the highest pleasure. The Pali word is sukha, and is, as is so often the case with the most important terms in the Buddhist teachings, he doesn't define sukha. It can be translated as bliss, pleasure, ease, well-being, happiness. And the Buddha does talk about different levels of sukha and different ways that sukha functions. In other words, he describes what's practical to know about sukha. And I think one of the reasons he doesn't define it is because as you practice your sense of what is pleasure, what is sukha, is going to develop. So it's important that things not get nailed down too tightly from the very beginning. The Buddha himself started out his search for a search for true happiness, a happiness that doesn't age, grow ill, or die. That's what he was looking for. And after having spent a lot of his time in the intense sensual pleasures of the palace, he did what so many people do who have been indulging in sensual pleasure that way. He went to the other extreme, tormented himself for six years denied himself food, forced himself not to breathe, grew very emaciated because he was afraid of pleasure. And one of the most important insights, though, of that period was when he finally came to realize that denying yourself any kind of pleasure at all is not the way. It does not succeed in liberating you. And then a question arose in his mind, is there another way? And he thought of the time when he was a child, sitting under the tree, and he entered the first jhana, rapture and pleasure, born of seclusion, accompanied by direct thought and evaluation. And he had an instinctive sense that that would be the path. But then he asked himself, well, why am I afraid of that pleasure? And he realized that it was nothing to be afraid of. It wasn't intoxicating, didn't cause any harm to anyone. Those are the two important things about pleasure that is unskillful, because there are so many pleasures in life. We see it all around us, the pleasures that people take in oppressing other people, or even if they're not conscious of the fact that there's oppression, they're not conscious of the fact that they're causing hardship, but the way they take pleasure does. And they will often close their minds to it deny that it's causing anybody any harm, or if it is causing somebody harm, it's causing harm to people who don't matter, or beings that don't matter. That's what you call harmful pleasure. Intoxicating pleasure is the kind of pleasure that dulls the mind so you can't really see what you're doing. The obvious pleasures, of course, are intoxicants.
the obvious pleasures of this sort are intoxicants, but there are other things as well. Anything that was a very strong addiction that dulls the mind, dulls your perceptions, that's a kind of pleasure to be avoided. But the pleasure of jhana is not harmful and it is not intoxicating. It's strange that you sometimes hear Dharma teachers warning you about the dangers of getting attached to the pleasures of jhana, that somehow it's a major thing to be avoided. But the Buddha never talked in those terms. On the one hand, he said, if you don't have the pleasure of jhana or something better than that, you will not be able to let loose your attachments to sensual pleasures. This is a principle we've been talking about several times this week, that to let go of a lower level of pleasure, you have to have something higher to hold on to. There has to be something to substitute for it, otherwise you go sneaking back. to your old ways, and denying yourself, denying the fact that you're doing that. Or you grow attached to the pride that you have, that you are so strong and so resilient and so tough in the practice that you don't need pleasure. And that pride becomes a major obstacle. So the Buddha said that the pleasure of jhana is a necessary part of the path. That's the kind of happiness that allows you to have a sense of well-being, a sense of nourishment. The Buddha actually talks of it in terms of food. He says we feed on rapture. Wonder meditating. And he talks about John as a storehouse of provisions. He compares the practice to building and maintaining a fort on the on a frontier. Mindfulness is your doorkeeper. Discernment is the plaster wall you have that the, the enemy can't climb up because he can't get a foothold on the plaster. And jhana is your storehouse of grain, honey, oil, all the food you need in order to keep going. So it's a necessary part of the practice. keeps you nourished. And as for the danger of getting attached to that nourishment, there's only one passage I can find in the canon where the Buddha talks about the danger of jhana, but it's relatively minor. He says once you get to the point of jhana and you decide you don't want to go any further, he says it's like holding on to a stick that has sap on it, and you, your hand gets stuck to the stick because of the sap. But, he says, when you jhana does not make it impossible to get unstuck. In fact, you need the quiet, you need the stillness of jhana in order to look at the happiness that you've been attached to so far in your life. And then when you finally get encouraged, or you encourage yourself to ask if there's something better than this, that becomes the solvent that takes the sap off your hands. And in any event, I don't know of anyone who's killed anyone, stolen anything, broken any of the precepts through an attachment to jhana, but you look at the way people are attached to sensual pleasures. And that's the basis for a lot of the, the cruelty and heartlessness and thoughtlessness and the harm that people cause one another. And you realize if you're not attached to the, the pleasure of John, if you don't have that available, you're going to be sneaking back to the, the type of pleasure that can cause all kinds of all kinds of harm for yourself and for other people. So it's important that you not be afraid of the pleasure in the practice and that you not try to avoid it for the fear that you'll get stuck. Of course you're going to get stuck, but it's the kind of pleasure that allows you to clarify the mind. So you can begin to see what's going on. This is an important part of right noble concentration, not simply that you get into the different levels of jhana.
but that the mind can then step back while you're in the jhana. The Buddha gives an analogy of a person sitting who's watching someone who's lying down, or a person standing who's watching someone sitting. In other words, you're slightly above and behind, and you can see what's going on. You thoroughly comprehend how the mind relates to its object. And it gives you insight into the process of fabrication. This is where fabrication becomes clearest, is when you're in a state of strong concentration. And you can see the movements of the mind very clearly. And then you ultimately re reach the point where you decide that even the pleasure of jhana is not pleasant enough. It's not peaceful enough. You want something more peaceful, something more solid. So it's not like you give up the idea of happiness, it's just your idea of happiness gets more refined. And this is when you can let go of the jhana and, through insight into the process of fabrication, allowing the fabrication to stop. I, you no longer try to fabricate anything out of what you've got in the present moment. That's when the mind opens up in an unexpected way to something that's not fabricated. And the realization hits. So when the Buddha said there, there is a deathless happiness. He knew what he was talking about, because you've got your evidence right there. And you see very clearly the, the stress that's involved even in the fabrication of a very subtle pleasure of concentration, because you've got something better to compare it with. So the Buddha's not teaching us to be stoic and just have a stiff upper lip and deny ourselves pleasure. He's actually a real connoisseur of pleasure. He wanted only the highest happiness, and he found it. And he wants us to want only the highest happiness and to practice so that we can find it. He didn't say that pleasure is bad or numbness is good, but he did say there are different levels of pleasure and they have different effects on the mind. And you want to look at the pleasure you find in various aspects of your life and see which kinds of pleasure are harmful, intoxicating, which ones help to clear the mind. And it's not just the pleasure of concentration, there's the pleasure of generosity, the pleasure of observing the precepts. The Buddha talks about how the practice of generosity and the precepts gives rise to a sense of joy, a sense of well-being. This becomes a basis for concentration. And from there you develop it through the more refined levels of pleasure that come with concentration. As the mind grows clearer and clearer, then you get to the ultimate pleasure, one with totally free from disturbance, because it lies outside of space and time. Years back, at a commemoration for John Lee's passing. It was the last commemoration I attended before I came back to the States. And they had invited a senior monk from Bangkok to give a Dharma talk. That was kind of the concluding Dharma talk of the commemoration. And about 15 minutes before he was scheduled to get up in the Dharma seat, he still hadn't arrived, and they got a phone call. He was stuck in traffic. He wouldn't be able to make it in time. So they asked one of the forester Johns who was there to get up and give a talk. And so he got up and gave a talk on how the central teaching of the Buddha was all about suffering and stress. He talked about the Four Noble Truths. And just a few minutes after he had finished, the senior monk from Bangkok finally arrived. And so they asked him to get up in the servant seat to give a talk. He hadn't heard what the previous talk was. So he got up and he said, you know, the Buddha's central teaching was all about happiness. And you know, both were right. The Buddha talked about suffering because he wanted us to see where the suffering is that we tend not to see, so we can look for a higher happiness and the, the kind of happiness we tend to content ourselves with. So when the Buddha talked about dukkha, suffering or stress, it wasn't just to say that, okay, you've got to accept the fact that life is miserable and just learn how to be equanimous about that. He's saying there is suffering, but it doesn't have to be there. There's the suffering of 
the three characteristics, which is just inherent in compounded things. And on top of that, there's the suffering of the Four Noble Truths, which is caused by craving and clinging. That suffering you can put an end to. And in the course of putting an end to that, the suffering of the three characteristics doesn't weigh on the mind anymore, because you found something that lies beyond what's compounded. So the Buddha talks about suffering for the sake of happiness, for the sake of true happiness. He's like a doctor who, when you go see the doctor, asks you, okay, what's wrong? Where does it hurt? The doctor's not being pessimistic. The doctor talks about your illness because the doctor has a cure. And the Buddha talked about himself as a doctor. He talks about stress and suffering because he has a cure to lead to the health of true happiness. So always keep this point in mind as you practice. We're not here to run away from pleasure. We're not here to deny pleasure. We're here to see pleasure clearly and to become connoisseurs. What kind of pleasure when you indulge in it has harmful results? What kind of pleasure when you indulge in it becomes part of the path? So you can find the ultimate pleasure that doesn't require indulgence at all. It's just there. That's what we're practicing for.